Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Joining us for the second half of our show is Kathy Lynn Taylor, former National Security Council Director for International Finance Policy and author of Red is the New Black, How Women Can Fashion a More Powerful America. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Thanks so much for having me. Kathy, I asked you on because you seem to be picking up the baton of conservative feminism passed on by the late firebrand Phyllis Schlafly. Your new book lays out a pretty classic set of arguments for the conservative position, but in a form I've never seen before. I'd like to open our conversation with a direct quote from the preface of your book. We are modern women living the sex and city dream, entrepreneurs, mothers, and fashion mavens who have managed to do it all. But there's one curious blind spot in my friend's worldview. They don't seem to be aware of how conservatism made all this possible. Kathy, liberals have had a monopoly on feminism since the 1960s. Why do you think you can beat them at their own game? Well, I think part of the problem is it's been a game. It's been a lot of rhetoric and messaging. And the Democrats have been very successful at doing that. And really, one of the things I do in this book is call out that we as conservatives have not been as good. And I think part of addressing this issue for women is making sure that they understand that we're honest about this, that we're going to embrace it from all sides. The reality is it's not a his or hers. It's not a theirs or ours. It's time to change the conversation. And we can do that by breaking it down to something that we all know and understand, values. What values do we live by? And how does that inform the policy choices that best empower us? And that's really what this book tries to do. In an essence, it tries to find common ground in very uncommon times. You know, the Independent Women's Forum calls you the modern feminist. What does that say about the Andrea Dworkin School of Feminism? Well, I don't even know what feminism is anymore to some extent. We have women more than ever before working. You know, 40% of households now today, the woman is the breadwinner. We have women being mothers, CEOs, caregivers, chauffeurs, doctors, everything within their household. Women are taking over the world in a really powerful and wonderful way. And so if you want to apply that to a feminist theory, you know, I think the bigger question for us today is how do we do it all? That's what women are really struggling with. And that's where we need to make sure public policy really informs and helps and supports women. You claim that conservative public policy serves women better than liberal public policy. How can freedom ever compete with free stuff? <laughs> it's a tough competition to your point, but free stuff only lasts so long. I have two little girls and they love to go to the toy store. But, you know, what I always say to them is it's really fun to get stuff, but it's more fun to appreciate and love what you have. Getting stuff only, the, the high from that only lasts so long. I don't know if you remember when the movie Goodwill Hunting came out many years ago mm -hmm. and Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, when they accepted their award, later in an interview, Matt Damon said something that I thought was so appropriate and, and really rang true with me, which he said, it's been so fun, so hard, but so fun, and I'm paraphrasing, but so fun to get here that I think the journey is the best part. And doesn't that often prove true? We work so hard for something in our lives. And then when we get it, it's not always as easy to manage it. I, as a young woman working in New York City, was really fortunate to be surrounded by so many amazing women who I'm lucky enough to call friends. These are women who are CEOs of companies, stay-at-home moms, leaders and, and creators of nonprofits. And yet, when we went to the voting booth, we pulled different levers. And I found that fascinating. Why was that? Why could they not see what I was seeing? And so one of the reasons I wrote this book was to really understand why were all my friends essentially Democrats when I was a conservative? And what I found when I looked into the issue is that they were actually living and they are living much more conservatively than they think. But the Democrats have done such a good job over the years saying, look, if you're a woman and you're kind and you care about the world around you, you must be a Democrat. You Republicans, you're just in the kitchen holding babies, wearing buns, toting guns, and they've done a really good job. And frankly, we as conservatives haven't done as good a job on the messaging. And sometimes we've let a few speak for many in not such a productive way. And I think unless we own that, women won't take this conversation seriously. And so I try to really own that in the book. But the reality is, when you take away this policy or that policy, you take away the argument, you take away the rhetoric, and so much darn noise that's in this system and in this country, 
right now and you bring it down to something very basic, values, then actually there's a lot of common ground. And I would argue, as I do in the book, that if you bring it down to the values that empower today's successful, smart, even sexy women, that those values and the policies that have best supported them over the years are actually more conservative than women would think. And we as conservatives must do a better job of getting that message out. Kathy, you insist on evaluating economic policies based on their actual results rather than their stated intentions. I mean, this is completely out of step with how modern politics works. <laughs> Imagine that, knowing what you're getting. <laughs> yeah. What makes you believe you can distract people from the glowing promises that accompany every new government program and instead get them to pay attention to the unintended consequences that always seem to follow? Well, you know, Bill, I talked about one reason that I wrote the book, which was this disconnect between how women are thinking and necessarily living. But the second reason I wrote the book is that I have been very blessed to have had a very unusual uh, set of experiences in my life. I've been on Wall Street as an executive. I've been an entrepreneur on Main Street. And I have had the good fortune to serve at the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue. And one of the things that I saw, which was really shocking to me at the time, was the disconnect in the languages that these three proverbial streets use. So why does the average American really care what the national debt is? Why does the average American really care if welfare spending goes up $1 trillion a year or $2 trillion? I didn't care much about it, I'll be honest. I didn't know much about it. And until I got to live and breathe and really be effective in those three worlds, I realized, gosh, very few people get to do that. And so very few people get to understand the translation that needs to happen among the languages spoken on those three streets. I felt that I had an unusual perspective that hopefully would help my fellow citizens, men or women. And I have as many men read this book and say, wow, I learned a lot about policy that I didn't know. You're a businessman like me. We were both former venture capital investors. And it goes back to a really simple principle in our everyday lives. Would you spend on something if you didn't understand the value you were getting? No, you wouldn't buy something. You wouldn't invest in something using your own wallet if you didn't know what you were getting for it. You wouldn't buy strawberries if you didn't know that you could eat them. If you knew you were going to open the container and they would be moldy, you wouldn't purchase them. It's that simple. And businesses now understand that they need to not only look at results, but track and measure and report back, reflect and learn from them. And the best businesses do that. And we as a government need to do that for our society. We owe that to our citizens. We're using our money, taxpayers' money, to fund a government in order to help make our lives better. The least we can do in return for the citizens' contribution is make sure citizens know where that money is going and hopefully even benefit from it each and every one of them themselves. Well, Milton Friedman makes a very famous point about how careful you are spending your own money on yourself, your own money on someone else, and someone else's money on someone else. That's right. That's right. And it's, you know, a very, very simple concept, but we make it so complicated. And we, and I say we because I've been a policymaker, we're not doing a good job making this stuff clear for the average person. And so what happens is you get a lot of rhetoric. And one of my favorite examples is what we have going on, the conversation we have going on in our country today about Wall Street versus Main Street. People love to hate Wall Street. They're just rich, greedy guys, right? They don't care about us. They're taking our money. I, in rural North Dakota, am worse off because that Wall Street exists today. And that's simply fundamentally not the case when you look at the construct of Wall Street and Main Street. Wall Street has two purposes. It helps people get access to capital, to money, and helps people, individuals, and companies, nonprofits, and other entities, and governments manage the flow of that money. And without it, the littlest bakery in the most rural part of America can't survive. Your dollar you spend in the store today ends up in somebody else's pocket. Money is fungible. It flows. And if we don't understand that those flows are connected and we need each other, then how can we actually get to good policy? So we're doing ourselves such a disservice by letting this rhetoric not only bubble up, but be pervasive and persistent. And policymakers have to do a better job of understanding the other side of the equation. A lot of policymakers are not, they don't have business backgrounds. They're lawyers or teachers or whatever background they had in the past. We've got to get educated on one another's languages so that we can do a better job 
explaining this stuff because it matters. It matters a lot. Because it matters. It matters a lot. Washington. These seem to favor large businesses over small, union shops over independence, and rigid wage and hour rules over the flexible gig economy. What's going to happen to classic Main Street entrepreneurship if this trend continues? It's already happening, the impact to Main Street and the average entrepreneur. We're seeing a decline for the first time in decades in the start of new businesses. And that's really important, Bill, because as you know, I'm sure, new businesses and small businesses employ most of the people in this country. What regulation does is stifles innovation. It costs businesses and therefore individuals money, and it makes it very hard for businesses to invest in new products and services and therefore create new jobs. And it's not just small businesses that are hurt. Even our big companies are being hurt. We have an enormous amount of regulation that was put in place, particularly through Sarbanes-Oxley and then during the recession. Again, it comes back to understanding the language. We have policymakers and regulators who have not taken the time to understand maybe the operational impacts to a business. So they make this regulation thinking, let's just deal with the problem by making more rules. And then what they don't understand is those rules cost businesses money. And that means that businesses don't have that money to create new jobs. And that's a real problem. I'll give you a really small example. When President Obama put in place the Affordable Care Act, one of the things he did was say, look, if you've been let go from a job, then we are going to make your COBRA payment reimbursed through a tax credit. And we're going to grandfather you in. So even though I'm announcing this today, as of a few months ago, if even if you were let go, we're going to make that COBRA payment basically reimbursable to you. Well, that little thing, which seemed like a fair and good idea, right? Everybody was struggling. But what happened? Companies from large and small had to rewire their entire system to reflect that tax impact and how that payment was going to be accounted for. Companies spent millions of dollars in endless man and women hours and time and effort on legal fees, accountants, tech consultants to do that, never knowing would it be enforced, would it be changed. It's such a small thing. But a simple change like that, that meant to be good, simply because the president did not understand how businesses really work because he's never been in one, in some ways did more harm than good. Kathy, inequality remains a potent political issue. Is social mobility declining in America, as some have warned, or is it still possible to climb from the bottom to the top economically? It's absolutely still possible, but it is declining, and it's not declining for the reasons that people think, and that's what's so important to have a discussion about. People think it's declining because some people are getting wealthier, but the real reason when you look at the policies and you actually spend the time to understand it and look at the statistics that social mobility is declining and people are getting poorer, when we give out money and we don't have folks have skin in the game, then we are not doing anyone a service. It's predicted that in the next seven years, 2.5 million people will leave the workforce entirely because of disincentives that tie back to Obama's Affordable Mm. Care Act. We have to incentivize people to want to play the game, to want to work. And if we offer too many benefits, then it's easier to take those and not work. That does not lead to a productive society, and it doesn't lead to a happy person. This takes us back to how you open your book, which is a discussion of personal accountability. Is that compatible with the identity-based culture we've been moving towards, where one group competes with another to see who can make the loudest claims to victimhood? It's my biggest concern about American society. If people don't respect each other, how do we expect to get along and have a productive society? If a woman can't go to work and be safe on the way there without getting shot or can't sing in a concert and leave that concert without being killed, how do we expect to go on? If we don't treat each other like all lives matter and we don't respect each other and hold each other accountable to the laws that let us be free and safe, how will we ever have a better society than we have today? And I think that's what has America so concerned. I mean, when you have over 70% of the country deeply dissatisfied on both sides of the aisle, You really have to look at the root causes of that. And we have to create a place where our laws are upheld, where rules make a difference, where there's civility to each other. It starts at the top, 
and it has to happen in our communities. And we have a top that is deeply disconnected and policies that are deeply disconnected from our communities. Kathy, financial independence was once a goal most Americans sought, yet today more of our fellow citizens rely on government assistance than ever before. And given the taxes needed to maintain massive income redistribution and the load we retiring baby boomers are about to drop on the public purse, how are young people ever supposed to climb the economic ladder? It's really hard, and it's very concerning. You know, robbing Peter to pay Paul never works. It's bad policy that's gotten us here, not any one individual. And the American dream is what makes this country so special. And so how do we find a way, to your point, to make sure our young people have that American dream? Well, it comes from a sense of personal accountability and the willingness to get out there and work hard. And that's still possible in this country. You know, the difference between liberalism and conservatism is that liberalism wants to create equal outcomes. Conservatism wants to create equal opportunity. We each have to still do our part, and young people have to be willing to do that, as does any age person in this country. And so the real question is, how do we have a tax policy and a spending policy that makes sense? You know, we talk about fiscal policy, we get so engrossed in this mumble jumble, but all fiscal policy really is, it's the same way I at home work to get money and decide in my family budget how to spend it. It's a very simple concept, but we make it so confusing and so challenging. Well, let me ask you about that. Like many conservatives, your book sounds the alarm about the dangers of both excessive government debt and and loose monetary policies. How come these subjects are not even on the radar in this crazy presidential campaign? It's unbelievable to me that it's not, because this is the stuff that affects Americans. But when we talk about fiscal policy or tax policy, you know, Trump just came out with his child care tax policy. And you read it, and you're not, you know, kudos to him for having a conversation that's been outside of conservative and Republican circles for decades. But, you know, the average American is not going to read that one pager and really be able to say how that's going to impact them yet. And that's not because Americans aren't smart. They're incredibly smart. It's just because we talk in a mumble jumble and we have a disconnect in the languages and because it's confusing. We've got to help people understand what it means when the government takes the money and how the government spends it. It's not, let me take it from you and move it over here. It's how do we get it and how do we keep it? You know, if we paid off all our debt today, each American would have to come up with over $50,000. Everybody, today, each person. And I mean every baby, every elderly, every American. We're in a situation that's unsustainable because we haven't been responsible. And so we've got to, you know, make this conversation. And what I try to do in this book is really unpack these policies in this language to make it really accessible and apply to you in everyday life. And I use examples that are hopefully much more relatable to people and to women because we've been so forgotten in this conversation. You know, for decades, the examples have been sports and nukes when you talk about policy. Well, I have examples about being a mom and shoes (laughs) and clothes because even though this book is as informative for men, I think we have missed the chance to speak much more intimately with women about these issues. But it has to have the conversation or it won't work. Well, coming back to where we opened our conversation, Paint us a picture of where conservative feminism is heading. Is there a place at the women's table for voices like yours, or do you foresee a long, lonely battle ahead? (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) Uh, No, I don't think it's a long, lonely battle. I think that there is a surge of women who want to have a voice that's not about yelling and screaming, but that's about having a conversation. And I am lucky to be among many peers who are making that case. And I think that if we have the conversation in the right way and we own the fact, and some conservatives are not going to like this, that we haven't necessarily done it well in the past, and that some of us in particular may have not always done it well, we have to own that. Otherwise, no one will think we're credible, right? We have to acknowledge that. Then I think that this is not a lonely battle because values and finding common values is a pretty easy thing to do. And so I have a lot of liberal friends, and they've read this book. And in fact, someone I don't even know reached out to me yesterday and she said, I didn't think I was going to like what I read, but I actually agree with almost everything you said. (laughs) So it's about how we say it. It's about how we do it. And it's about respect. The top 20% of earners in the U.S. are paying more than 80% of the taxes. So we can keep taxing them all day long, but at some point that runs out. We have to stop thinking about his, hers, mine, yours, me, myself, and I. I write in the book, there's no I in team, but there is a me, 
And I say that because we have to stop thinking about ourselves, but we have to also start taking responsibility for ourselves so that all of us can contribute and feel like we're important players in this society. Kathy, it's been a delight chatting with you. Please keep in touch, and thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. That was Kathy Lynn Taylor, author of Red is the New Black, How Women Can Fashion a More Powerful America, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio Hour on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And while you're at it, take a look at realclearfuture.com for daily updates on the next big wave of technologies. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Old Boston Restorations, for their support. Old Boston is a boutique property management company in Boston South End. Visit them online at oldbostonrestorations.com. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then. See you then.